So JavaScript has a new proposal to introduce a new operator that looks something like this. And the operator will allow you to call promises or any functions without the need to do try and catch, but you get the response or you get the result like this, where the first parameter is the error, like the error thrown inside of the fetch in here, and the second one is the actual data or the actual return. For example, for fetch in here, we're just like doing a wait because fetch returns a promise. We use the operator in here, which is called the safe assignment operator to safely get a response in here and also catch the errors. So the new proposal is called the ECMAScript Save Assignment Operator, which is still under active development in here. And the proposal simply introduces a new operator. That's actually what it looks like with a question mark, then an equal, which is simply refers to a safe assignment. So that's what they call it. And this one simplifies error handling by transforming the results of a function into a tuple. And a tuple in JavaScript looks something like this, which is an array of fun or more items, where the first item in this case is going to be the error. If there's any error thrown inside of a function or promise, this is where it's going to be caught. And this is actually like the error is going to be returned right away for you. And the second parameter is going to be the data returned from that function or promise. And the main idea behind this proposal is actually to stop or prevent people or developers from neglecting to handle these errors, because obviously when you run a function or a fetch, you can choose whether to handle the errors using like a try catch exceptions, or you can completely neglect that one, which is could cause a huge issues, especially if you're doing this in production or big projects. I mean, neglecting to handle the specific errors or exceptions can lead to a disaster or even your program to absolutely crash. So this new proposal is for forcing handling errors by introducing this new syntax. So first, let's go ahead and take a look at the proposal and try to do a simple demo. So hopefully in here, inside of this repository, there's a polyfill provided by the author of this proposal, obviously. And it's called polyfill.javascript in here. It has like the code for polyfilling or sort of like patching the prototype of a function and a promise to make them work with the new this new syntax using this symbol result sort of like a special symbol that was created by the polyfill. We're going to jump into that in a second, but this will help us to test a new feature by returning a tuple. But the only thing or the only limitation we cannot do right now, because we still need a preprocessor like Babel or something like this that, you know, takes our code and figure out where to add the symbol results instead of like this specific keyword or this specific operator, the new syntax operator in here, because it doesn't exist inside of JavaScript. So we need a preprocessor for this to properly handle it. So for now, we're not going to be actually using this, but instead we're just going to go rogue and use this specific implementation because later on, the preprocessor will take this code that we type. This is basically the user type sort of code. And by the pre or when provided to the preprocessor, it's just going to take this one and convert it to something like this. So, so just for the time being for this specific demo, because it's still in early stages, we're just going to go ahead and do it this way by ourselves. So if you see something like this, please do not freak out. All right, great. So now let's go ahead and jump into our demo in here. Now, first I've downloaded this polyfill. This is basically what the polyfill looks like. If you want to jump into exactly what the polyfill looks like, it's pretty simple. All it does, it modifies the actual prototype of a function and the promise, like the standard function, like the standard ECMAScript or JavaScript function and the standard promise as well. It modifies the prototype by adding this new symbol results. And the symbol result is just like a symbol of a value of result. As simple as that. So you modify, they add this new property of simple to results, and it creates a simple function frame. Now inside of this function, it goes and calls the original function by using this dot apply dot this and passing in, you know, the original arguments passed in. Now it gets the results. So here it does some recursive cases where if the result is another sort of like objects in here or it has an instance of a simple result, which means we need to go ahead and call that simple result again. So just like a recursive function, this is just like a very special case. Now later on, if everything good, we're just going to return this tuple where the error is null because we've got no errors and we just the result or return the actual result in here at the second argument or the second item inside of the tuple. And of course, we're doing or wrapping the whole thing in here using try catch because that's how JavaScript works. So we try this code in here, and if anything fails inside of the catch block in here, we're just gonna catch the error and we're just gonna like return again. We're not gonna rethrow or anything, but we're just gonna return another tuple where right now there is an error, but the second argument doesn't exist, which means it's just gonna be undefined. That's what it looks like. And the same thing goes for the promise.prototype. Now we just go ahead and do the same thing in here, add a prototype, an async function. We try the promise like results, await this, and then we return the data, or we just simply return, or you know, of course, catch the error and return the error in here as a tuple. I mean, it's pretty simple. It should just, 
you know, if you know JavaScript well enough and you know how prototypes works, this should be very easy for you to understand. All right, great. So now I created this proposal.javascript file to actually do this simple demo. So first thing in here, I've actually created another fetch function instead of using the standard fetch, I created a function or a method called enhance fetch simply because our original fetch doesn't throw errors. That's like by design, that's how it works. It doesn't throw errors. It just like returns response. Okay, in here equal to false. If there is any status like 404 or any status other than 200, like, you know, when there is an error, but it doesn't throw that. So I created this enhance function to basically add this throw functionality to simulate something cool and, you know, to be able to use or throw an actual exception. So that's all I'm doing in here. That's why I'm not using the standard, but of course the standard fetch in here is just used in the lining or behind the scenes right over here inside of the function. So here I created this method called fetch a user, which is an asynchronous method that of course we're going to return a promise and it takes the ID of the user that we want to fetch from the API. Now here we're doing the enhanced fetch dot bind window. We have to bind it because we're using this special syntax. And if we do not bind it, we're going to have a, a serious issue. So you don't need to care about this one because this will be handled later on by a preprocessor. Or if this proposal gets ever integrated into the ECMAScript standard, this will be handled behind the scenes. So you don't have to do that manually. But for now, I have to do it because I'm just stitching things together for a simple demo. Now again, here I'm using the fetch in here. Remember, I'm just doing this fetch enhance fetch dot bind window. I'm getting the fetch, and here I need to access this simple result. As I said before, when we use a preprocessor or later on when it's included inside of the fun or the language, the ECMAScript standard language, instead of doing it this way, we're going to just use this simple operator, which is going to be translated into something like this. So this is basically I'm just like putting this inside of a comment, so you could tell exactly what we're doing in here. So this is basically like the operator use fetch use await like you normally do. But the response or result in here is going to be returned is going to be a tuple. The first one is going to be the error. So if there is any error, a third inside of this fetch, remember we're throwing if there is any bad status code in here, just throwing a new error, fetch failed. So if there's anything thrown, that's going to be returned right over here. It's not going to be thrown into the outer scope that can be catched by try catch or something, but instead it's going to be returning or simply returned into this like first tuples item. And the second item inside of the tuple is the actual response coming from the fetch. Pretty cool. So now we can just do something like this. So if there is a response error, we can just throw an error in here inside of that one. So you could just go into the outer scope or you can do a console log or whatever you want. Second thing in here, now we've got the response. If the response is cool, I need to go ahead and access the response JSON. So I'm doing the same thing in here with the binding that we did before. You don't need to care about that right now. And I'm just doing await JSON, the same thing in here, simple results. So later on, it's going to be this specific operator over here. And of course, the response is going to be either a JSON error if there is any issues or anything goes sideways when trying to parse the JSON return from the API. Otherwise, we're going to have this data in here valid. And also, second time in here, we go ahead and do this. Oh, if, if there's any JSON error, we're just going to simply throw user JSON parse failed. And lastly, I'm just going to go ahead and return the data. That's pretty cool, right? I mean, everything looks pretty tidy in here. It looks pretty simple. Now, down here, I created this self-executing function here, which is like a synchronous function. You can just think of this as a normal executing function that's going to execute the code. And here I'm doing fetch a user. And again, I'm using the symbol to results. So basically translates to the same operator in here, like the safe assignment operator we already saw before. I'm just saying, to, oh, can you please go ahead and fetch a user of an ID 11 and do an await for this. And again, I'm going to use the tuple thing because I'm throwing normal stuff in here. I'm using the symbol door results operator and everything. I'm using like the new safe assignment operator. So I should expect a tuple gets returned in here with the first item to be an error and the second item to be the actual user. And later on, I can do the same checking. So if there is any error, I can just go to console log, oh, fetching user failed. And I just go in and console log the error. Otherwise, else in here, it means everything is good and we got a user. I'm just going to do fetch user normally in here. Now, user ID in here, 11 doesn't exist. I'm going to switch it up to 10 because that one does exist. And let's go ahead and try to run this code inside of the browser. So I go to the browser in here and open up the console. As you can see, we got fetch a user. And if you open up the objects, we got the user fetch for us successfully without any errors or issues. And even we're using, of course, the save assignment operator in here, right over here for fetching a user. That means this specific block in here, there's no errors. That means this else block is being executed and we got fetch a user. And this is basically the user. So everything looks absolutely awesome. 
Now let's go ahead and try to fetch an user ID that does not exist inside of the database and see how it reacts. It's probably going to return a 404 or throw a 404 not found error. So I'm going to see how this safe assignment is going to be handled and how all the errors in here are going to be working using our you know safe assignments and the polyfill we're putting together in here. So if we go ahead and refresh, it's going to say, oh, fetching user failed an error fetching user failed. So it's basically fetching the user failed in here with a 404 not found. And if we try to find exactly where this one is being called, if we go ahead and do put one in here, refresh, as curious, fetching user failed one, that means this specific block of code is being executed all the way from here. So when we throw an error in here, there's a response error. When we throw an error in here, it's going to be like coming up right over here. If you want to test, I'm just going to do thrown over here. Just to go ahead and see exactly the error as curious in here. Error is fetching user failed thrown. So that means this specific block of code is being executed. The response error in here is actually returning a response from the fetch and our new sort of safe operator is working perfectly. And we're not even using one try catch at all. Like everything here is using a new symbol thing. Of course, using the polyfill and the polyfill behind the scenes, it uses try catch. So what do you think about this new operator? I'm actually in love with this one. It makes things a lot simpler. You don't need to introduce a try catch. It fixes the issues that were introduced by TriCache because TriCache has some limitations and this overcomes those limitations and makes like working with code a little more like sequential to just like going line by line instead of like block by block and you know making the actual runtime or the execution jumping from one block to another block which I'm not a big fan of it makes it a little bit confusing but I love this new way and this has been actually inspired by many other languages like Go, Rust, Zig so many other languages and I absolutely love how Go implemented this first. I want to see the same example in here but instead using the try catch like the old gold wave try catch basically the same thing so just fetch a user in here just doing the enhanced stuff as we did before we fetch inside of the try in here like the try block and if there's any error gonna be raised from this we're just gonna like you know catch it right over here and rethrow it inside of the catch block and whenever we execute we're just gonna have to do another try catch and the same thing goes so because this example is very simple and straightforward everything looks pretty good with try catch try catch looks pretty innocent but the proposal like it gives you an idea of like why sometimes try cache kind of like is limiting and a little bit and kind of bad and kind of like makes the code a little harder to read. So if you go back to the proposal, the original proposal and go to try catch is not enough. So why try catch is not enough. So actually there is two examples in here. The first one is when you nest one level for each error handling. So that means you nest try catch another inside of another try catch, which makes it like super hard. Imagine having three or four try catches inside of each other. This is going to make it absolutely insane and very hard to know exactly which block is going to be executed next. I know that you can use just one try catch and you can use the instance of sort of thing, which is not always valid when using, you know, JavaScript. And the second thing in here, because try catch uses like a block sort of thing. So any variables you define inside of the block in here, for example, let's say if you define file contents inside of the try block, it's not going to be accessed outside of that block or inside of the, the catch block in here, which is going to make it hard. And it's going to make you need to declare those out of the scope, like on the outer function scope in here so you define let's file contents and the json then you can reuse them throughout the whole thing which is not a desirable thing to do so there's actually a few examples why try cache is a little bit bad and this syntax might make javascript powerful oh yeah and if you're basically wondering why not data first inside of the tuple where error is preceding the data inside of the tuple in here for example why is it like this and not just like this as the example in here states that if the data comes first, that is going to make error very easy to forget again. And it's just going to break the whole point of the proposal of like enforcing error handling inside of JavaScript. So if you make data first, that you're going to make the error that comes after the data in the tuple, like in the ordering of the items of the tuple, you're going to make it like very easy to be ignored and you don't have to specifically like specify it, but not like this. If you make error first, in order for you to access the data, you have to access the error, then you have to access the data. Or if you want to completely suppress the error and completely ignore it, you can do something like this with this really awesome JavaScript weird syntax. So yeah, I really advise you guys to go ahead and read more on this section here to know exactly why. 
And as to where this syntax has been inspired from, as I said before, for example, the Go error handling in here, it uses this syntax, which is pretty good. And I'm pretty sure like a lot of Go developers love this specific syntax. So it looks something like this. Let's say you want to open up a file name that is named filename.extension. So you do os.open. So basically like this is the syntax in here for returning error. And the first one is actually the file descriptor, like the pointer to the actual file because this is Go. We use pointers in here. But this is basically the idea. You get an error in here and it just like gets returned. You don't use or you don't need to use the try catch or anything like that. And you simply just do, oh, if there's an error in here, just log out the error or do whatever you want. Or the same thing goes in here for the Zig language that has this special try keyword in here that allows you to return the error and it has pretty cool stuff in here. Or the other beloved language in here that a lot of people love is Rust and basically has the same thing here. It has another operator that's an exclamation mark that comes at the end of an invocation of a function or even the try exclamation mark macro. So yeah, it's not about just JavaScript. And in my opinion, I love this syntax. I think it might need a little of like refinements and contributions to make it perfect and handle all the edge cases properly because as we all know, this is JavaScript. But yeah, I'm in love with this new proposal. So let me know what you guys think about this proposal in the comments below. I would love to see your opinion. Maybe there is a better way to do this. Maybe there's you know some contribution in here to make the operator better. Or maybe if you know the edge cases that will raise from this specific operator. But anyway, guys, thank you guys for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed and catch you all hopefully in the next ones.